Hello, everybody. It is Thursday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, Assistant Sports Editor for Multimedia at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, joined for our weekly Zeiss is Right chat here on the Post-Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel by Paul Zeiss, Post-Gazette Sports Columnist. Paul, how are you? Well, I'm doing good, Adam. I'm doing better than I was a few days ago, for sure, but I'm good. Well, we got a lot to get into today, Paul. We got um, the the NFLPA survey that was pretty scathing about the Steelers and, and Art Rooney individually um, kind of reacting to the second year in a row. The Steelers fare poorly in this survey. Um, maybe talk a little bit about the quarterback situation Is that as the rumors continue to fly with free agency nearly upon us. Um, we'll also get into some uh, pit basketball. They lost to Clemson on Tuesday night. Um, are they done? We're, we're going to get into that question of, of whether they're going to be able to make the NCAA tournament still. Talk about the Penguins and their big win in Vancouver on Tuesday night. And then um, we're going to talk a little Pirates and some Paul Skeens, who is going to get his first Grapefruit League Grapefruit League outing um, today as you're watching this. Um, so we're lots to talk about, Paul. I'm excited to get into it. Before we do, just want to remind you, our primary sponsor for this episode and every episode of the Zeiss is Right show here on the Post Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel is Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. There's no better place to get new windows and doors installed in your home than Pella, who can help you save on energy costs year-round. Schedule a free in-home consultation with your local Pella Windows and Doors to find the right product for your home and budget. Give them a call at 866-593-1560 to discuss your project further. That's 866-593-1560 to get started planning on your new windows and doors installation with Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. All right, Paul, let's get into this, this report card that the Steelers – um, were handed by this was taken out by players uh, a survey of players on on how they rate the their their teams in various categories and the Steelers did pretty bad in a lot of them they were 29th in treatment of families 30th in nutrition and dietitian 30th in locker room 29th in training room 28th in team travel 31st in ownership so that's referring specifically to our Rooney the second and I guess some minority owners um, and there was a, a little quote appended to the report saying there's little confidence among respondents in the willingness of club owner Art Rooney II to invest in a better workplace. Uh, Paul, what is going on? This, this, this is If this was about Bob Nutting, we'd be losing our mind uh, with the Pirates, but it's it's Art Rooney. Uh, so, I, you know, what's your reaction to, to the second year in a row that's going poorly? Well, one of the things that, that, that it's, it's going to hurt the Steelers forever is their locker room and their facilities over on the South side because they're, they're, Adam, there's nothing they can do about it. They can make them maybe a little nicer, but they can't make them bigger. And that's been the biggest problem. You know, there was talk about trying to expand the locker room. Well, where are you expanding it over there? You can't, there's no room. Um, the, 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 the weight room, guess what? There's no room. You can't go back behind the facility and, and make it bigger. Do you want to know why? Because the field that they practice on is literally about 50 feet from the from the door they walk out on. Maybe not even that many feet. I mean, there's just there's no room that way. They obviously share the facilities with Pitt, and that's something that has, it, 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 that has to, and I'm told eventually is going to change. Uh, it was an arrangement that worked well for both teams early on, but as you know, Adam, things evolve. And, you know, both kind of both teams have sort of outgrown the, the you know, the being in half the building. So, the, you know, what I expect to happen at some point is the Steelers probably are going to be the team. Uh, either they'll buy out the uh, their buyout the, or I'm sorry, Pitt will they'll, they'll have Pitt buy out the portion of the building that the Steelers use and they'll go build the facility like the Penguins did up in Cranberry. I'm not saying in Cranberry, it could be anywhere, but I, but the bottom line is they're going to have to do that. And if they do that, then, then they'll have a chance uh, maybe to do some, do, do better in the locker room part of it or the facilities part of it, or, you know, the, all of those things that they just, there's not a lot they can do with that. Now the, the team, uh, what, what do they call it? Family treatment thing or whatever it is, yeah. the, the treatment of family stuff. I, I'm going to be very blunt. I don't care about that. I mean, you know, the Chargers, they, the Chargers got a failing grade because they charged their players $75 for game day daycare. And I guess the Steelers don't even have game day daycare. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> what are we talking about here? Really? You know, um, I don't, I don't worry about that. I think it's a bad look for the Steelers. Definitely. 
Do I think that it's a bad um, testament maybe to the culture that they have? Maybe. But uh, the culture that they have in the building. But to me, you know, the Chiefs got F's in a lot of these things too. So does it really affect winning? And if you look at the NFLPA, you know, usually their player surveys that come out, what are two things that are almost always the case? Who's one of the top three coaches that everybody in the league wants to play for? Tomlin. Who's one of the top three organizations that everybody in the league wants to play for? The Steelers. So the, the Rooneys have to do better. There's no question. Maybe there's some bells and whistles they can add to the locker room and to the weight room and, and that. But honestly, um, their hands are tied in some ways just because of, uh, I don't know, what, 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 what do we call it? Ge geometry, geography, whatever it is. You can't, there's nowhere to go this way. There's nowhere to go this way. There's nowhere to go this way. And the bottom line is they're sharing a facility. They're sharing it with the, uh, the rehab facility that's across the parking lot. You know, the, the medical, uh, the physical therapy and all that stuff. I mean, there's so many things. So parking is an issue as well. And it's going to be an issue. There's just no space. Um, so do I think that this is a good look for the Roonies? No. Do I think that they should take a hard look at maybe some of the things they're doing uh, to sort of change a little bit of the perception? Yes. But I, I just, I, I don't see a real solution to the locker room, the weight room that, that, there's just not I, – I've been in there a million times. There's nowhere to go. Well, I'll pose the question this way, Paul. I mean, you mentioned the Penguins. The Penguins moved out of, of you know, what was it, South Point they were at for a long time. Um, it's more than a decade ago. They have their facility. They have events there. Uh, when Yarmir Yager was here practicing with the team, people were able to come in and see that. Um, and and there's a ton of space over there, a massive parking lot. Um is it fair to hold Art Rooney accountable for not having made a move like that earlier, knowing that, you know, a team like the Penguins is, is doing it, knowing that, you know, even the Pirates, their facility is not, you know, kind of the same in, in that, um, you know, it's down in Florida and there's a lot more space and you're not downtown. But the Pirates have invested in their facilities here. They've invested in their facilities in the Dominican Republic. Why is a brand like the Steelers so late to this party? You're absolutely right. I mean, if you want to, if you want that to be the criticism, I can, I can absolutely live with that. The only thing I'll say that makes it a little different is you got to remember now you've got to find room for an indoor facility and maybe two, one or two uh, outdoor practice fields along with the building uh, where you're housing everything, along with parking. So, I mean, there are places probably that 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 kind of land does exist, but you know, I don't know that it's as, as easy as simple as uh, being able to just go build a building somewhere. There's a lot of space outside the building that needs to be available as well. You know, there's probably places in Cranberry, you know, maybe even in, uh, out, out uh, near the airport out that way um, or whatever. There's, there's a lot of different places they need to go. That's where, uh, I mean, you know, I, 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 there's the new highway out there, Paul. I wonder if there's, I, there's been rumors that maybe they're going to build the whole stadium there someday, um, you know, out by the airport uh, along the, um, right. the, new, the new interstate that they put in. Um, you know, west southwest of the city. Um, here's my question too, Paul. Is is you mentioned that you don't think that this is a competitive disadvantage for them, but when you look at the the scores in like training and dietitian, do you question whether they're getting the most out of uh, some of their guys? Um, and, and I'll throw into this that earlier in the day, Cam Hayward on his podcast was talking about basically the cascade of injuries that happened to them in this season and how he had one in training camp that turned into one in week one that ended up, you know, because he was overcompensating for that one, he had another injury and he had to get, you know, these surgeries in the off season. Um, they had, the, there were these questions about Kenny's pick, Kenny Pickett's concussion. Was that that this season or was that his rookie season? Um, you know, how he was being treated. I mean, at a certain point, don't you question if those become competitive disadvantages? And I know you mentioned that the chiefs fared poorly in this too, but, the Chiefs have better players, and I, I wonder. <laughs> I think it's a different conversation. Can you win without being great in all of these areas? Sure, I agree with that. But is it a competitive disadvantage if you if you're a team like the Steelers that doesn't have a franchise quarterback right now? Don't you need to be getting more out of the guys you have on the roster? And isn't isn't this part of that? Well, I think that's one of the things the Pirates figured out, isn't it? To maximize every other aspect of the of of you know what they do, be it. Their training, their remember they the, the rest regiments, their all that stuff. I I mean, listen, the diet and train, but 
they made some changes to their training staff in this off season and their weight conditioning staff and their weight training staff and all that stuff. They made some changes in those areas um, in this off season. So who knows, maybe this is part of it and part of why they did that. Um, you know, I, I would agree that you have to maximize in those areas at all the time. Um, by the same token, like I said, it doesn't seem to affect their ability to attract people to want to come play for them. Doesn't seem to attract, you know, it doesn't seem to really, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't know that it really detracts from their ability to win football games either. It, are they as good as they possibly could be? I mean, that, I guess that's up for discussion and an argument. Uh, one of the things that I've always said about the Steelers, and it's finally just started now to change a little bit, is that they have way too many people that have been there forever. And I don't think in sports that's a good thing. I know a lot of people think it's a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing. I think that sometimes their loyalty – leads them to 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 leave people hanging around longer than they probably should. And sometimes maybe it leads to you're not getting the most up to date in areas like strength and conditioning and 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 training and and even diet and all that other stuff. So I, I agree to a point, but I, I feel like you're right because it's the Roonies, they'll get a little bit more of a pass. But but you know what? So would uh, if if Mario was still in charge of the the, the Penguins, right? And, and 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 the reality is the difference between Mario and the Roonies and Nutting is Mario, who obviously no longer owns the team. But let's go with when when Mario owned the team, you know, there it would be the same exact reaction, like not that they can do no wrong. Um, the difference between Mario and Nutting is the first two have a salary cap, and so. Because they have a salary cap, no one's ever talking about how they're cheap, how they, you know, how they have to pinch pennies to sign players, how players are out of their league and all that other stuff, like with with Nutting. And I think if if if, if Nutting didn't have, if Nutting had a salary cap and he had to spend to a certain level, a lot of the conversations about Nutting would be a lot different than they are. Oh yeah, um, I mean, I'm not defending. I'm not yeah. by any means defending Bob Nutting. I'm just saying, if if we're going to hold him to uh, to a standard, well, then then what point does Art Rooney? Who? Let's be fair. Art Rooney has not won as the as the head honcho of the Steelers, right? This is you know he's standing on the the legacy of his grandfather. He's standing on the legacy of his father, who won the six Super Bowls. But under his stewardship, this this franchise has not been that, and and you can blame any number of factors, but it hasn't. Um, and and here's a question I'll ask Paul is. Is this reflective of the Steelers maybe being cheap in other areas as well that maybe are not as forward facing, or at least that the, the, the players have as much experience with, like scouting, like uh, development, um, you know, in terms of, of finding players and, you know, even the coaching staff? How many times on this show have you and I talked about, well, the coaching staff's too small? Why aren't there some offensive analysts on this, um, you know, coming in with Arthur Smith? Why aren't there more? you know, just assistant coaches to, to kind of share the load. Um, is this the type of thing that you look at? That's how they handle their business on, on this end where the players deal with it. And then you question how the rest of the business is being conducted. Well, I mean, I think that's something that people have probably think about it this way, Adam, people have criticized Art Rooney, uh, the second far more than they ever did Dan. Um, in fact, people that are criticizing Art Rooney, the second have actually morphed it into criticizing the Rooney's, which they never did with Dan. And even though he was really kind of a disaster of an owner, they really never did with the chief either. Um, and I think part of it is because people understand exactly what you said. They haven't won anything with, with Art Rooney, number one. Number two, there's a perception that he is basically a lawyer and not a football guy. And number three, the perception of the Rooney's has always been that they will pinch pennies wherever they can. Um, the coaching staff is something we've talked about. You and I have talked about you know, they need to make it bigger and 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 be more willing to pay more money uh, than they do. They need to be willing to uh, delve into more of the areas that we talk about with advanced scouting and analytics and all the other stuff that all the teams that operate like modern football teams do. There's no question about it. Um, I don't know that that's even really all that much of a secret, or I don't even know if that's even one of those things that's really all that unspoken. People talk about the Roonies, they say, or about Art Rooney and the way that he runs the team. 
is that he probably does not give them the best chance to be successful because uh, he's still trying to do things in some ways like they did in the 70s and 80s, and just, it's not the 70s and 80s anymore. So, well, can I ask you this, Paul? Do you do you worry that that Art Rooney is not is kind of in that Bob Nutting bucket of of maybe in over his head in modern sports and and you know the way this is a billionaire's playland and because you know the the Rooney's wealth is tied into this team, right? Um, you know, maybe he doesn't just have the cash to throw around that that a Stan Kroenke might or um, you know any any number of you know bigger name billionaires out there. Um, who who treat these teams as as kind of like look at look at Steve Ballmer and what he's doing with the Clippers in the NBA and, and their new arena, you know e even on his best day I don't think Art Rooney can do things like that I don't think Bob Nutting can do things like that is is that part of the problem here you know but generally is is that at some point are you going to need to have higher dollar investors in this team? Yeah, and that's the catch twenty two because if you do that then maybe you have to give away some of your control. And the Rooneys have been in control of the Steelers for, you know, decades. Um, you know, and there's a discussion that that Art II is, is at some point going to hand it off to, I think it's his son maybe, Danny Rooney, or, or somebody who's a little bit more of a football guy. I think that'll help. But you're right in the fact that they can't do maybe some of the things. But, you know, they they, they make enough money, and there's enough money there that they should be able to do some of the things that we're talking about to sort of bring the, the, the whole operation into the, in, you know, into the 21st century or 22nd century or whatever we're into right now, <laughs> they should be able to do that with, with, without having to really, uh, you know, break the bank. I mean, we're not talking about, we're not talking about building a new stadium, you know, uh, building a new mm -hmm. facility. Okay. Yeah. That's going to cost a, a pretty penny, but guess what? I guarantee you, they, you know, UPMC, Highmark, some, you know, somebody like that in the city, U.S. Steel, one of these companies in, in the city, right, Google, someone's going to be able to be willing to pay money to give them a bunch of money. I'm sure that whatever township or borough or, or county, they, you know, they'll, they'll give them some money to have the Steelers facility in there, you know. So I, I don't even know if that's, a, you know, the stadium's different. But building a facility, they should be able to do. I think they're rich enough to do it. They should be able to build it in a state-of-the-art way, so that they have the, you know, I, I, I don't even know if they have like the the most modern like hot and cold tubs, which are almost essential when it comes to you know um, the different ways that you recover as an athlete. So all all I'm saying is, I, I do think that maybe they're not as rich as some of the other owners so that, you know, if they, they, they can't do a few things, maybe that other owners can, but I think that for the most part, the Rooney's make enough money. They should be able to do what we're talking about here. This isn't like really all that comprehensive stuff. I agree, Paul, but I will say, you know, in terms of the stadium, I don't know because um, I did a story a few years ago, Paul. I, I, I don't know if I've ever told the story on the podcast, but I did a story a few years ago reporting on the possibility of Pittsburgh ever hosting a college football bowl game. And when I called the Steelers, they said the Steelers are not – or that Acrisure Stadium was not up to the standard of being able to host an event like that. I said, you're telling me you can't get two Mac schools in here in December to, to play a bowl game in Pittsburgh? And they basically said, yeah. And then you know who I called next, Paul? I called the Pirates. I said, could you guys host a bowl game at PNC Park? And you know what they said? They said, yes. heck yeah. They said, heck yeah, we can. So I wonder sometimes about, you know, what, what Acrisure Stadium's – shelf life is and, and what part that plays in this given that the team just does not seem to be super pleased with it um i'll wrap this conversation paul with this question for you mike tomlin obviously ranked fifth among coaches got a, a very solid grade um does that matter to you especially as we you know when we're in season and the steelers take a terrible loss you and i are talking about what mike tomlin's responsibility is for it is the fact that the, there's a perception from the players that that He's the good guy and ownership is the bad guy. Does that matter to you in terms of the big picture with this team? No, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, you know, the one thing is he's the, the one comment that was made in the survey was, you know, he listens to the locker room. He listens to his locker room. I don't know that that's always good, by the way, but he listens to his locker room. Okay. I mean, he's the guy that they're mostly closely in contact with. You know what I noticed, Adam, today? I was actually talking about this on, on the radio. You know what I noticed today? If you do, if you go through that NFLPA, uh, um, if you go through that survey, 
pretty much every coach got a B plus or better. I mean, that tells you everything you need to know. For the most part, the players like the coaches they're playing for. The coaches that didn't do well, Brandon Staley fired. Uh, the guy from the Raiders, that you know, the Patriots guy, what's his name? Uh, uh, Josh uh, McDaniels. You know I mean, or yeah, right. Josh McDaniels. He got he got like a D or an F or whatever. But for the most part, and 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 Ron Rivera got a C, and he got fired. So my point is, if you think about it, it doesn't surprise me at all, um, and it really doesn't mean that much to me uh, because I expect players to say that. Tomlin's a, I mean, because look, Tomlin's a good dude. He's a cool, a cool cat. You know, he doesn't come off like a, a like an old crotchety guy or an old coach. You know, he comes off as more like, hey, he's one of the guys. It doesn't shock me at all. I mean, again, they probably deal with Tomlin, what, uh, five times a day. They probably deal with Art Rooney II, what, five times a year. So that doesn't, that doesn't shock me at all. Paul, last thing on the Steelers, um, it's been a busy week of rumors flying that the I think ESPN is reporting the Steelers are going to sign Mason Rudolph, or at least that's the plan, is, is they're going to bring him back. And then there's another report saying the Steelers have offered a second-round pick for Justin Fields, and the Bears want the first-round pick. And it, it seems like the, the closer we get to free agency, the more frantic this quarterback conversation gets, not less frantic despite you know the reporting from our own Jerry Dulac and others that – it's prob- Kenny Pickett's probably going to be the guy next season. Have you seen anything in the past week that's moved you from your, um, you know, ongoing stance that that is probably still going to be Kenny Pickett, no matter what we talk about and say over these next couple weeks? Yeah, no, there's no chance. It's going to be Kenny Pickett. I mean, everyone just needs to rel- just accept it. It's going to be Kenny Pickett. It's going to be the starter. And the backup is going to be somebody like Jacoby Brissett, like Ryan Tannehill, like, you know, any one of the names that we keep hearing, they throw out, well, this guy could be an alternate. No, he's not an alternate. It's actually the kind of guy the Steelers are going to go get. I mean, I just don't, I don't think there's any question in my mind. Uh, and the more that I read, the more that I see, the more that I hear, the more I'm convinced. They want Kenny Pickett to be the guy, and they're going to give him every opportunity and then some to be the guy. So, you know, the, the, the discussions about Russell Wilson and – Justin Fields and Kirk Cousins and, and the newest one with Baker Mayfield. It's all a pipe dream, if you ask me. Yeah, I'm still there with you, Paul, until I see a more convincing report. Um, let me get into the pit loss to Clemson on Tuesday night. Before we do, just want to thank another one of our sponsors, Pitt Johnstown. It's a pit quality education with up-close and personal learning, a top-ranked Northeast Public College by U.S. News and World Report. Generous scholarships and financial aid are available, located on 655 picturesque acres with easy access to the city center, including shopping and dining, vibrant campus life with an active D2 athlete community. Check out Pitt Johnstown today um paul pitt loses to, to clemson on tuesday night they were already on the right side of the bubble i think this was their last opportunity at least in the regular season to pick up a resume boosting win um i saw the draw on the acc network that they will have in the first round they'll probably get a team that that they have no upside against in that first round of the acc tournament um do you, are they toast do you think that they are out of the ncaa tournament at this point barring some run to the semifinals or maybe finals of the ACC tournament? I think at the very minimum have to get to the finals. And they have to get to the finals by beating somebody like Duke or North Carolina. I mean, there's very few teams, you know, that really, if they beat in the ACC tournament, I don't – I think they're toast because I don't know that there's anything left on their schedule – Right, that's going to give them an opportunity. I think they're just like, you know, serve holding wins, Paul. I mean, right. they, they, they're not getting them ahead. They're just like holding station with any of these. I, I mean, think was the only team that you had the chance to really move up in the eyes of the committee. I, I, I think if I looked at it correctly, you know, NC State is like about 88th or 87th maybe in the in the net. Uh, BC is like 98th, and Florida State is like say 92nd. And that's their last three games. Then, in, you know, in the first round of the uh, – they'll probably get a bye. In the first game again, the ACC tournament, it's going to be against the winner of, like, Georgia Tech and, you know, one of the other – Boston College. That doesn't help you, right? So you win that game. So now you're in – the next day is the quarterfinals. Okay. 
right? That would be the, uh, the next day would be the quarterfinals. Again, because the, the pigtail round is on Tuesday. Then the first round for teams like Pitt that have one bye would be Wednesday. So the quarterfinals would be Thursday, right? Yes. Right. Maybe you beat Duke there or North Carolina or whoever. I don't, I'd have, I don't have the bracket in front of me. You win a game like that there, you probably have, still have to win the semifinal game in order to really have a chance to get there. And, and, and here's the thing with Pitt. There's a couple things that are a problem that Pitt have. Number one, they just didn't perform in their non-conference. You, 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 people are going to point to a lot of different things. You know one of the worst things they have on their resume? A loss at home to Missouri. Missouri right now is 0-15 in the SEC. And they won at the Peterson Event Center. That's a game that's hard to overcome. When you're this close to the bubble, that's a game that's hard to overcome. The other thing is, and you know, Brad Brown now was talking about this from Clemson, and he's absolutely right. There's two ways in the non-conference that you really can bolster your resume. Play really bad teams and beat them by 50, or play good teams and win. Pitt didn't do either, <laughs> right? They kind of played sort of middling teams, and they won, but they kind of won in unimpressive fashion for the most part. They beat a couple teams by 20, but you understand what I'm saying. They beat a few teams by 20 or 30, but for the most part, what they did in the non-conference was sort of middling. And then they lost to Missouri, one of the you know one of the Power Five teams they played, and they lost another Power Five game. They just didn't do enough, and so then you get to the ACC, and that formula would have worked if the ACC was giving you the boost that you need, but the ACC isn't giving them the boost either. So if you add it all up and you look at it, you just say they needed that win last night because that was a quad one win at on the road. That would have given them a nice boost. And that probably would have put them close enough that if they won out, won their first game of the ACC tournament, right? You look at it, they probably would have been where they were last year, maybe first four, you know, or maybe even they get, they avoid the first four. But that's exactly kind of where they would have been. If they, if they would have win, won that game against Clemson and got that boost, it probably would have put them close enough to the line that, okay, now if you win the next three or four games, other teams will fall and, you know, whatever, you're going to be able to slide in. I just I just think that there's still a gap that beating Boston College, North Carolina State, and, and Florida State is not going to – and then, say, Georgia Tech, that's not going to do it. It's not going to do it to get you there. I think you might jump some teams that lose, Paul. But yeah, I agree with you. I don't think you're really you're not getting bonus points. You're not jumping up on you know on your own resume, and, and because your resume is better than someone who also keeps winning. I, I think it's just the teams that lose between here and the end that that they're going to have a chance to to get over. Maybe that's enough. I think right now it's probably not. Um, we'll, we'll get into some Jeff Capel questions. I think after the season because I, I want to see how this plays out. Um, well, let's get into the Penguins a little bit, Paul. Is it possible? Um, you know, after they beat Vancouver, uh, that that they're still in this, you know, in, in a meaningful way. They've gotten some points in the last week or so. You and I talked about that, um, you know, big home stand that, you know, I think they blew a, a big chance there. But um, and I also have a question about a lot of this trade talk. Is it possible that we're overstating their ability to fix themselves with trades, given the way, you know, prospects in hockey are, are very much dart throws outside of the, like, top 15 in any given NHL draft. It's not – I don't think – like I, I think a lot of the times we think of, of the Penguins in similar terms to the Pirates, but that's really not the way hockey is. You don't really have nearly as many, I think, difference-making players um, other than a few guys, maybe Tristan Jari, maybe Jake Gensel. Is there something to be said for keeping this thing mostly together and, and making some more cosmetic changes? Um, here's my thing, uh, Adam, it, it, the win against Vancouver, uh, really is, it's a big win for them. If they come back from this road trip with more than four points and they're already halfway there, if they come back from this road trip with more than four points, they've got two very winnable games at home before the trade deadline. They win them both of those. And now all of a sudden they're really within shouting distance, right? couple things that you got to remember. One, they're an old team. 
and they got four or five games in hand, that's great. But that means over the next three or four weeks, they're going to have to play a, a bunch of games with not a lot of rest in order to catch up. That could be a factor. But the thing about it is I'm convinced that if they're going to be within shouting distance, then they need to go out and add. And the only way they can add, because they don't have a lot of prospect capital and they don't have a lot of draft capital, the only way they can add is by making hockey trades. And those are hard to do. You know, it could be you're just trying to change your roster a little bit. It could be there's a couple of guys that, you know, you feel like, hey, we've got a guy who maybe is underachieving. You've got a guy that's maybe underachieving. Maybe a change of scenery for both works. You know, those are you know, really the only kind of deals they can make at the trade deadline, if they're truly going to try and get better and make a run, you know, to the playoffs this year. And it might be you trade Jake Gensel. Not because you're unloading or because you're, uh, you're, you're, you're trying to sell, but because he's an asset you have, and maybe he brings back two players that can help you, right? Uh, you know, younger, two younger players, one with some upside, one maybe that is, you know, got talent that maybe hasn't performed as well or, you know, a contract for contract type of thing. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you can do, but it's going to have to be hockey trades. You know, it's going to have to be hockey and contract trades where because because the idea that you're going to you know unload at the trade deadline, it's just not realistic, Adam, for the re reasons that you said. But also, I don't know that you have really many assets to unload like that. So. Trading Jake Gensel would make sense because then you get something for him, you know, and you could still re-sign him in the offseason if you really wanted to, you know, figure out how to, how to fit him back in under your cap. But they're going to have to make deals that involve sending a few of the guys on this team somewhere else to bring back some guys that they want to fit in this team. And that, Adam, if Cal Dubas can pull that one off, He's a genius. I don't know. Does that make sense? I don't even know if that makes, I know what I'm trying to say, but I don't know if it makes perfect sense what you're what, what I'm trying to say. But my point is if Cal Dubas can pull that off, he's a genius. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Paul. I, I think it's, it's, you know, I, I guess I've gotten kind of dubious just of, of the idea that you can trade Jay Gensel and you can trade Brian Rust and you can t trade Tristan Jari and, and rebuild and, and get younger I mean, that we just haven't really seen that through most of, of this recent Penguins run. Sands for when, you know, Connor Sherry, Brian Russ, some of those guys came up late in that first cup run with Mike Sullivan. Um, you know, it's much been much more about making what you're mentioning, those hockey trades. I think of uh, Tanner Pearson. I forget who they traded for him, but that was one of those change of scenery type of trades. Um, mixed results, you know, your mileage may vary. Um, you know, sometimes these trades work out, sometimes they don't, but I agree that it's, it's probably the only play that they have um, is to just kind of get a different mix of guys in there. Um, just the frustrating thing about Jake Gensel is he's probably the best winger Sidney Crosby's ever had. Um, and, and, you know, you can't take for granted, you know, they were, were finally able to find him either. Um, so it'll just be interesting to see how they value those two things, you know, the change of scenery, changing the roster up versus what Jake Gensel has done here. Paul, I'm going to wrap up with this uh, baseball question for you. How much is the Paul Skeens heat going to turn up? He's pitching today, um, Thursday, in the uh, his first Grapefruit League action um, against the Orioles. So we're going to finally get a chance to see him. Um, if he pitches well this spring and the Pirates don't make this fabled um, midseason, you know, trade for a number two starting pitcher, a guy to really bolster this rotation before the season, how much are we going to be talking about Paul Skeens, um, like, is he going to make the, the opening day roster? Probably not. They're probably going to super two him. How long do you allow them to super two? What's that level of heat going to be if they don't make this big trade that, that everyone's been teasing but still hasn't happened? The worst thing that can happen for the Pirates is that Paul Skeens comes out and just tears it up in spring training. That's the worst thing that can happen because there's going to be enormous pressure and enormous heat regardless of what they do. Either they can go out and get another pitcher. It doesn't matter. This is a guy everybody wants to see. So uh, the heat probably starts uh, today if he pitches really well. I guarantee if he pitches well, the, you know, the, the, the uh, talk of town and the talk on talk radio starting tomorrow, they better bring him up when, you know, uh, when, when they come north, he better be on the roster. Um, the heat, it, listen, 
You don't make a guy like that. That every here's the here's the here's the thing about schemes. One, he plays a position, right? That is very easily translatable, at least to most people. He pitches, and and it's number two, he's got that stuff that makes you go, wow, wow, he's unbelievable. And number three, all of us watched him all last spring in the College World Series, right? In the in the NCAA tournament. So everybody's seen the guy. It's not like he's one of these players that is just sort of a name or, you know, somewhat fictional name because we really haven't seen much of him or some high school kid or whatever. I mean, this is a kid we this is a guy we've all watched. We've all seen him. And everybody's like, man, this is a guy we want to see on the Pirates roster today. But that heat is uh, I probably already started at him. But I promise you, and again, we're taping this before he goes and takes them out on Thursday. If he does, like, I don't know what they're going to give him, three innings or whatever. I don't know. Say three, if he goes three innings and strikes out seven or something, people are going to lose their minds. Um, and I don't think it matters who they sign. I don't care. I don't think it matters if they sign another pitcher. I really don't. Yeah, I, I don't either. I, and I think that's a big component that, that you're right about, Paul, is, is that we have seen him. I think when G Garrett Cole is probably the, the closest point of comparison that we have in recent Pirates history to Paul Skeens. And, and I don't. I know I didn't watch him. Um, and if anyone did, they they were you had to kind of go look for it. Um, you know, college baseball was not as prominent then and available then as it is now. Um, when you've got a million channels, you've got all these different conference channels you can put on a college baseball game pretty much any night of the week in the spring, um, you know, alongside MLB. So you're right. This is, He's much more of a known commodity. That's why I think it's going to be interesting because if you remember that summer, there was a lot of heat around Garrett Cole and why is he <laughs> here? Um, and the Pirates end up losing the division by a couple of games. Um, so, you know, there people have that fresh in their minds too, right? Yeah, that's what I mean. People have seen the guy pitch. They've seen a lot of them. They've they've seen him recently. They've seen him pitch at a high level. They saw him hit 103 on the gun a few times. I mean, people are in, in really intrigued by this guy. They they really like this guy. It's it's one of the it's it's one of the few times I can remember where a number one pick in baseball is almost being treated like a number one pick in football. You know. You pick a you pick a guy in, in the first round in football. Everybody thinks he better be on the field immediately. Usually in baseball, it doesn't work that way. Usually everybody understands it's going to be three or four years. But this is a case where he's an older guy because he was a college kid, and everybody got to see him play just like they watch college football, and they get to see, for instance, Caleb Williams. You get to watch him play all the time. So if you're a Bears fan and they pick him, you're like, man, this guy better be on the field immediately. So that's what's going on here. It's a little different. Everybody has watched this guy. Everybody's seen this guy. And we have saw him hit 103 on the gun. We saw that he's got, you know, big time, big, big league arm. And, and we saw it recently. So, Well, we it, saw how good the SEC was, Paul. I mean, that, that right. was the big talking point at the time. Well, the, the SEC is basically the equivalent of double A, you know. Right. And if, right. if that's true, then, then he should be just as close as some of these guys we've talked about that were in double A. Um, that, that, you know, especially because in this Pirates regime, I think this is important to point out to people, too. They treat double A like where the real prospects play. And, and um, you know, triple A is almost like purgatory and there's not a whole lot of development in their eyes going on there. Um, so if he's a double A pitcher to start the season, I think that's not going to quiet anything at all. No, absolutely not. Especially, you know, especially here's the other thing, Adam, and you know how these things go. Let's put him in Altoona, right? His first start, he goes crazy. His second start, he goes crazy. Over the course of that week and a half, the Pirates starters all struggle. <laughs> can you imagine that? A week yeah. into the season, I mean, can you imagine that? That's yeah, that's the kind of thing where the best thing again can for the Pirates is he he's okay, just okay in spring training, and then gets off to just an okay start at, in Double A, and then the Pirates pitchers get off to a reasonably good start. That that is about the only scenario where they can survive. Yeah, I, I just wonder if you can really make it to June. You know, with, with if if you're going to tell people you're serious about winning this season, can can you really do that? Uh, well, they've they've shown us time and time again, <laughs> you know, that that they don't think the way that we do, and they'll keep the players down there, you know, for for getting that extra year. But you know, at least it's worth talking about. Uh, Paul, any final thoughts on the week before we wrap up here? 
No, not really. Um, I think uh, we covered a lot of ground. I'll be interested to see, you know, next week we might be talking about Paul Skeens because he might actually have two uh, appearances be be between now and the next time we talk. Yeah, so it'll be interesting. We'll have a little bit of, of data to work off. Um, thank you for joining me today, Paul. If you enjoyed this video, please like it. Help us out in the YouTube algorithm. Please subscribe to the channel. We're going to have a lot more content for the rest of the week. Christopher Carter, Jerry Dulac, Ray Fittipaldo, they're all out at the NFL Combine in Indianapolis. I know uh, Chris is putting together a lot of good stuff with interviews with players, stuff like that. So you don't want to miss any of that. Stay subscribed to the channel. Um, I'll be back on Saturday. We'll be doing our NFL Mock Draft Tracker, I believe. It's Ray Fittipaldo's turn on that. And Christopher Carter will be back Friday with the North Shore Drive. So uh, stay tuned. A lot more coming at you. And uh, it's, it's going to be a fun spring, I think. Yeah, it should be. It absolutely should be. Uh, hopefully, hopefully the Pirates uh, <clears throat> keep us interested all the way into fall, actually. Yeah, that would be, that would be a nice change of pace. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com.